I'm Deanna, and welcome to another Dow Repaint video. Bienvenue, comment ça va? Moi, je vais très bien, car la poupée d'aujourd'hui, nous faisons la reine des fleurs, ou en anglais, the queen of flowers. After my April Showers doll, I was inspired to create another spring-themed doll, and there's nothing quite as iconic to spring than flowers. Florals for spring, groundbreaking. While I was daydreaming about flowers, I started thinking about the deliciously sweet and ornate design style of Rococo, which was popular in Europe in about the 18th century. Rococo style extends into interior design, architecture, and into the fashion of the time. When something was of the Rococo style, it was always elaborately decorated, elegant, and often was in the pastel color palette. If influencers were a thing at that time, then Queen Marie Antoinette would be the Rococo influencer. The French queen is known for her over-the-top and intensely adorned large hairstyles and richly decorated and huge dresses. So after going down a rabbit hole reading about Marie Antoinette's fashion, I decided to make a queen who rules over all the flowers. While my doll is just going to be a floral fantasy inspired by elements of that time period, I still think it's going to be a perfect homage to that sugary sweet feel that comes from Rococo. So enough talking, our queen awaits. Oniva. For today's regal and floral queen, I'm on the hunt for the perfect doll. I know I want her to have a nod to the Rococo aesthetic, so I think a doll with blue or pink skin tones would be ideal. After looking through my collection, I've decided to go with this Frankie Stein Monster High doll. Frankie checked all of the boxes for me for this project. Her blue skin tone will look good with the floral colors. Her square face shape and pouty expression read as royal to me. And, don't tell Frankie I said this, but she has a rather boxy forehead that will support a large and dramatic hairstyle, and this will be important later. And, speaking of Marie Antoinette, before Frankie can blossom into our flower queen, we first have to remove her head. A quick soak in boiling hot water will soften the rubber of her head and melt the glue of her hair plugs. Now, all I have to do is carefully remove her head from her body and come in with my forcep tool to pull out the old hair plugs. I'm going to be giving her a whole new face, so I'm taking a cotton pad with pure acetone to remove the factory paint on her face. I'm also using it to remove the Frankenstein-y stitches painted on her body. If I was going to change her skin tone, at this point I would give her a couple layers of white acrylic paint. But, since we're going to be using her blue-green skin tone, we're just going to seal it with Mr. Super Clear and jump right into shading. Her skin tones are obviously going to be floral inspired, but they aren't coming from one single source of flower inspiration. Instead, I'm marrying the classic floral colors of pink, purple, yellow, and blue with her blue-green skin tone. Using my pink soft pastels, I'm layering pinks on areas of the face that show the most blushing, but I'm also applying it around the eyes as a foundation of her future eye makeup and to start blocking in her lips. In her T-zone, I'm using a yellow color. 
Often flowers will have pinks and yellows blending together in the petals, and the forehead is a great place to add this yellow because this part of the face usually appears as a warmer color than on other parts of the face. Now to start bringing in darker colors to define the recessed areas of her face. I'm applying a dark purple to her temples, around the eyes, and under her nose, and you know, other places that are shadowy like that. With her base skin set, I can now draw in her eye shape. I use my watercolor pencils for this, and I use a color that can be easily erased if needed. Now that I'm happy with how her eyes look, I'm lining areas with a dark blue acrylic paint. I've only outlined the tops of her irises because I want to give them a gradient look using pinks and purples. To prep the area for the gradient, I'm filling the entire eye with two coats of a basic rose pink color. While the first layer of pink dries, I'm going to clean up the whites of her scleras, which I blocked in off camera. Now I'm taking a dark purple color and blending it out with the darkest area at the top of the irises. The top of the iris is a darker color than the bottom because the eyelashes cast a shadow across the tops of the eyes. Jumping forward, I let the paint dry and I added more details to her water lines. Now I'm working on her makeup look. There's this old makeup trick I'm using where you use scotch tape to help make really sharp cat eye makeup. I'm coming in with a dark blue and I'm smoking out my soft pastels as a base of the cat eye. Now as I peel off the tape, you can see that the lines for her eyeliner are super duper sharp. I want to take the tones of her eyelashes deeper, so I'm using a black watercolor pencil to build up her lash line and to make her really sharp eyeliner really, really, really sharp. I'm also using that same blue pastel color to give some light shading under her lower lashes and to define her nose shape. Off camera, I blocked in her eyebrows, and I've also blocked in her pupils and these starburst lines on her irises in white. Now I'm taking the time to highlight above her lash line, in her tear ducts, and right on the tip of her nose. These areas tend to reflect a lot of light in real life, so adding these touches makes her seem much more alive. The white paint on her eyes has dried, so I can start to go over them. The white created a base that will make the new colors pop on top of them. Next, I want her eyes to have a lot of sparkle, so I'm giving each one a handful of little catch lights. Coming in with a black watercolor pencil, I'm giving her some lower eyelashes to give her a really feminine look. Jumping back up to the eyebrows, I'm using my black watercolor pencil to define the ends of her brows. Now I'm using blue paint to give the illusion of individual hairs on the brows.
To go with a floral theme, I'm giving her face pink freckles, which are kind of similar to the speckles on an orchid flower. Recently, I bought some doll-sized eyelashes, and I think she's the perfect doll to try them out on. Using a toothpick, I'm applying a thin line of glue to her lash line, and I'm going to start applying the lashes along the curve of her eye. Obviously, I can't leave this hanging off of her, so I'm going to snip it off and apply the second eye's eyelashes. Now it's time to give her body the floral touch as we come in with soft pastels and start shading the body. First, I'm using dark blues and purples to shade and contour. This will really emphasize the curvature of her legs and the rest of her body. After I've sealed the first layer of shading with Mr. Super Clear Sealant, I'm really coming in strongly with my pink blushing. I love using this mini brush for the blushing because its soft bristles give me a really smooth application and I can really work the pigment into all the nooks and crannies of her body. Just like on her face, I'm also applying yellow pastels as almost a highlight. I love the soft and almost painterly effect that blending these colors together give her skin. Obviously, we aren't going for natural skin tones, but I think using these soft pastel colors really mimics the subtle color shifts that you can see in flower petals. So for our floral highness, we need to make her a larger than life hairstyle. I talked a little bit in the beginning of this video about being inspired by Marie Antoinette and the kind of rococo fashion of that age. So for her hairstyle, it's going to be one part inspired by that with a big and voluminous hairdo and another part kind of inspired by fantasy and sci-fi hair looks. I'm starting her updo with these braids that I made using yarn. I'm adding in first so I can build the rest of the hair on top and then they can be left to frame the face. Next up, I'm going to apply some yarn hair wefts that I made out of the same yarn that I used for the braids. I'm applying a couple layers on top of each other in the front and I'm going to trim them to form her bangs. For the rest of her hair, there are a couple of zones to her updo that I'll need to build and shape. The first zone will be at the back of her head. I want to give this area some volume while being slicked back into something in between a bumpet and a beehive. To build this area, I'm first starting with rows of wefts at the back of the head. Once I get to the top of her head, I'm going to reverse the direction that the wefts are applied so that her hair can be pulled back without showing the yarn weft glue seams. As you can see, there's now a gap between the lower and upper sections of the hair wefts. I've applied a generous amount of glue here and I'm twisting and balling up some of the lower section of hair to make it into a bumpet. With that part securely in place, I'm taking what's left of the lower section and gluing it upwards over the bump.
Then I'm taking the upper layer and wrapping it in a similar way around the bump to give it a more smooth and finished appearance. For the sides, I left room for what I'm calling puff buns. I'm not the best with hair terminology, but basically using some excess hair weft fluff, I made two fluff balls by squeezing the fluff and condensing it with glue. After each puff bun is in place, I'm starting to strategically place the remaining braided yarn from earlier. First, I'm taking it around the seams of the buns. Next, I'm covering the part between the bangs and the back of the updo, but then I'm also continuing to wrap the braid along the sides of the buns. Now it's time to clean up some areas and apply some final embellishments. Off camera, I wet her bangs down with water and then using cling wrap, wrap them securely and let them dry overnight. This made her bangs lay flatter and using my pal, Mr. Snippy, I can start trimming and shaping her bangs. Our queen needs a crown and I have this perfect crown charm I can use. For the other embellishments, I have this bag of pearlescent charms, and quite a few of them are flowers. So I'm going to decorate each puff bun with an array of flowers. While I was thinking about royal attire, I started thinking about those huge skirts that the royals used to wear and those cage-like crinolines that they would wear underneath the skirts to give it structure and that big voluminous shape. I've seen a lot of cage style dresses in high fashion magazines that utilize that kind of crinoline look. While looking at these, I started thinking about garden trellises, those structures that flowers grow up in gardens. And then I found this amazing Haley Page design, and it was just a perfect match for my vision. So I'm gonna to try to replicate parts of it for my doll's design. So let's go ahead and start constructing our cage dress. For its structure, I'm making a series of hoops out of this fabric coated boning. The boning is flexible, but it is also strong enough to hold the other hoops up. Once the glue is dry, I'm using more of the boning to make some vertical strips for the cage. This is what we'll use to attach the other hoops, and it's what's going to really give the crinoline that cage look. I've marked off where I want each strip to go, and I'm trying to space them as evenly as possible. While the glue dries, I made a simple dress for her to wear under the cage. I've left the topmost hoop open so I can easily slip the crinoline over the dress. Now I can close it in the back and she is locked into her cage. Barbaric? Yes. Fabulous? Also yes. With her cage in place, now I can start coming in with these paper flowers to make it look like a trellis with cascading flowers. 
I want this section to look embellished, but simple at the same time, so I'm using very soft and pastel colored paper flowers. To give her that floral glory, I'm taking a page out of Las Vegas showgirl costumes and giving her a big bad flower to wear. For her floral arrangement, I'm using a material I've never actually used before, heat shrink plastic. You may know this stuff as shrinky dink plastic, but basically it's a type of plastic that you can draw on using color pencils or markers, and then you heat it or bake it in the oven and it shrinks down to about 50% of its size. I'm using this petal template I found to pick out how large I want to originally size the petals before I cut them. I recently saw some projects on Pinterest using this plastic and it really inspired me to use it with my doll making. The plastic allows me to use shading and drawing techniques that I love using with colored pencils. And for this project, I can get some really fine details on the petals. Like I said earlier, you can bake this in the oven and it will shrink down perfectly flat. But instead, I'm going to use my heat gun, which will allow me to manipulate how it shrinks down. As it shrinks down, it starts to curl itself around the edges, and I want to keep that look to get realistic petals. Now that the petals have cooled and hardened, I'm going to come in with some markers to give them a little bit more detail and texture. I've covered the back of each petal with Elmer's glue and I'll give each a thick coat or two of pink glitter. Now to attach the petals, and I've decided to arrange them in an open flower arrangement around the torso around where I left off on the paper flowers. I was able to trim off the plastic in any necessary places, and hot glue is providing me with a strong enough adhesive to adhere the petals to the dress. Last but not least are her shoes. Now, shoes have always been a big struggle for me. There have been many failed shoe attempts that have not made it into my videos. And I usually have to turn to my supply drawer to fish out a pair of Monster High shoes. But as you can see, there is a new toy in my studio that I will be using for her shoes today. For our queen's shoes, I'm using a 3D high heel design created by the doll artist rock star, Moonlight Jewel. She created several 3D designs for her shoe ebook, and I'll provide a link to her shop for anyone interested. Here they are, hot off the printer. After removing their little base, I'm prepping them for glitter too. And for a cohesive look, I am of course using the same color that I used on the petals. I've glued the lower portions of the shoes directly to her feet, and for the upper portion, I'm going to continue to use these paper flowers. Now that she's fully dressed, we can start putting her back together and get ready to see her final look. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, may I present to you Her Royal Highness, the Queen of Flowers. 
So I must say she was quite the project and took a bit of time for me to complete, even though I was basically working on her non-stop these past few weeks. But I'd say the end result was quite worth it. She was just one of those projects where every element turned out just how I imagined, really from head to toe. And of course, I want to know what you think of her. Comment below and let me know what you like about her, maybe what you wish I did differently. You guys' continued support and suggestions have really kept the fire going inside me to continue to learn and improve this art form, and it always makes my day hearing from you. All right, Her Royal Highness and I have to discuss the complexities of international pollen politics, but I'll see you next time with another Dollree Paint video. Salut!